When matters of race are located and called attention to in American literature, critical response has tended to be on the order of a humanistic nostrum, or a dismissal mandated by the label political. Excising the political from the life of the mind is a sacrifice that is proven costly. I think of this erasure as a kind of trembling hypochondria, always curing itself with unnecessary surgery. A criticism that needs to insist that literature is not only universal, but also race-free, risks lobotomizing that literature and diminishes both the art and the artist. Hi, I'm Eric. Hi, I'm Freedom. This is Nick. You're listening to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. Where today we're talking about Toni Morrison's Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination, which is basically her critical analysis of kind of the components of what you could call American national literature and all the themes and basically the underlying racial pieces of that. So Eric, you read a quote at the beginning that sort of um, outlined a lot of her opinions about, you know, treating race as an important piece of the literature itself and not necessarily separating it from the literature, which I know is kind of a current topic in, in how do we read, you know, certain pieces of, of literature. So, um, I don't know, kind of what are your initial thoughts on that? That quote really resonated with me because I think it not only captures the discussion we're having as, um, you know, two white males and a uh, Latino, Latina, <laughs> um, this, you know, it's very timely. These discussions right now are really a little prickly and a little touchy. And I think that the reason this quote very much resonated with me is because because Morrison seems to be saying that we need, whether it's about American literature or about anything in today's culture or society for that matter, she seems to be saying that, no, it's exactly the opposite, that we um, cannot be tentative about talking about this stuff and that we need to both be more aware of these undercurrents that are in our discussions around literature or otherwise, but also feel almost compelled to talk about them regardless of who we are. And I think going back to after finishing, originally finishing this book and knowing that we were doing a podcast, there was an initial sense that I don't know how comfortable I, I feel <laughs> about talking about this book or or equipped maybe is a better word. And and maybe the point is, is that no one is fully equipped and that we need to really um, all be talking about it regardless of our sense origins. of how much knowledge we have about it and our origins, right? I think yeah. that's a great comment. Yeah, I feel the, the same way. I began doing my mental notes thinking, okay, I feel totally alien in this thing because I'm not white, I'm not American, I'm not black or African American or anything like that. So I feel like the only thing that I can do is just read this thing first as a person and then as a somebody that has read a lot of literature so after doing a lot of uh, stops and uh, thinking about it i do believe that we can all learn from the three essays she she uh, wrote first to understand the importance of the history of the u.s as it is with all the shame and all the horrible things that happen, just as anywhere else. And then maybe how we are exposed to a lot of uh, artistic uh, or rep representations that we shouldn't just consume. We should ask ourselves, what does it mean in for the other? So for me, the otherness is the thing that I that stuck with me with from the book, the, how we perceive the other. Right. I think... You know, my own sort of personal realization going through this thing, one of the things that was most impactful that like really set it for me is um, she goes through to list common American themes and then attributes those to those themes only really existing if there is this divide, if there is this separate set of classes, separate set of structures, right? And she kind of, I'm going to read them off. And so she says, Americans fear of being outcast, of failing, of powerlessness, their fear of boundarylessness, of nature unbridled and crouched for attack their fear of the absence of so-called civilization, their fear of loneliness, of aggression, both external and internal, in short, the terror of human freedom, the thing they coveted most of all. And as she outlined that, 
it basically made me realize that that's actually sort of my favorite components of what American literature is. These are the elements that speak to me. And I've been reading some Hemingway recently, and she certainly spends a lot of time on Hemingway. But I think a thing that has been developing in my mind that she's kind of solidified is a lot of this literature that she mentions is written by one audience for another audience is actually a little bit of a fantasy. It only exists if you sort of focus on the one part and create this otherness, as she mentions, to sort of allow this gap. And so kind of reevaluating a lot of like American classics and actually some of the themes that I find so much resonance with and thinking of it as a fantasy that we've created kind of actually unsettled me a lot. It made me question the things that I like, the questions of, of just, you know, what do I get from literature and what am I looking for? Is it just something to echo back to me? And I actually just sort of feel a little, you know, like I said, unsettled. It's, it's kind of like ripping the blinders off of, you know, decades of reading. Yeah, but it, the the thing that it's really interesting uh, is that she wrote this in the 90s. And now we almost 30 years have passed. And this is more uh, contemporary than, than I thought. At the beginning, I, I was just uh, saying to myself, okay, this is weird, because she's saying that identity is more of uh, is defined by the other. And I didn't understand that. But what she was saying for me was a complete dissonance in my brain because um, what I have read is from Latin America and the blackness in, black in Latin America is conceived in a different way from the perspective of the Caribbean, basically. So there's two writers that uh, go deeply into that, uh, Luis Pales Matos and um, a Cuban, uh, another Cuban, uh, Cuban writer. But what they say It's totally different, and even though they they apparently seem familiar, uh, it's it's a different perspective. And what she's saying now, for me, it's more uh, valuable, basically, because it's it's something that I can apply now in my reality. Right. Yeah. And as we go in, kind of the next podcast topic, Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, which I think a lot of us are kind of already sort of delving into, it's really helped me frame how specific and how organized and how purposeful all of her writing is. I think that's a comment she made that she writes this critical analysis as a writer, not necessarily as a reader. Certainly she exists as both, but that in thinking about a lot of these works as something that other people wrote in a very purposeful manner, she can then start to dissect, you know, a lot of these underlying themes, which either directly acknowledge the Africanist presence, as she says, Or just sort of, um, you know, kind of a buried theme that's present in Poe and some of the other works. So I know, Eric, you'd kind of you'd kind of pointed out a couple of, you know, the works that she mentioned that you were somewhat familiar with and you're already thinking about as she was outlining some of the themes. So kind of how do you look at some of those works a little bit differently now? Well, I think that's what makes this such a rich piece of work. I, I, you know, it's interesting when you bring up when this was written. It was also written at a time when a lot of that cultural sort of um, criticism that was based around looking at literature and other forms of art through a very specific lens, whether it was Marxist or feminist or through a cultural lens. And I think some of the criticism of that criticism is that it often distracted from the actual text, one from the actual text, probably maybe a little too much. Like it was trying to sort of make, put a square peg argument into the round hole of the, of the text. And I think what is really great about this piece of work. And it is interesting that, that Morrison is a writer because to me, this literary criticism, criticism, instead of obfuscating or distracting, it was illuminating in the most really dramatic way. I mean, it was just this huge light that just shone suddenly on everything, like you said, that I had read. And yeah, I mean, it was funny. I was writing down authors as I went through this, like, Henderson the Rain King, you know, <laughs> William Faulkner, Hemingway. And it made me see those books in a completely new light. And I think I would extend that even more. You know, Philip Roth died last week, and Philip Roth was definitely an, an author that meant a lot to me. Um, certainly, he was a gateway into literature for me. It was a way for me to understand my dad being Jewish. But To me, it was interesting after reading this and hearing often the criticisms of his work about being misogynist, you could say that 
that concept of the other is very much in his literature, but you could argue that it's 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 more around women than it is, you know, the African American experience. And and I think that it made me even question his work, sort of in a new way. Um, which and I'm anxious to kind of go back and read it to be honest, because I, I at first I was I would dismiss a lot of those comments about his work that I think that's too simplistic a a criticism to throw at him, but. This book has made me think that there is a criticism in there that's a little bit more nuanced that could go back to what she's talking about, this idea of, of creating this other, whether it's out of women or African-Americans or whatever. And I think that, to me, that's the gift of this book, is that I'm questioning all these authors that I read, even if they're not so directly tied as something like Bellow or Faulkner or the Gertrude Stein Three Lives example – you know, it's everything now. And I think that's really rich. Right. And it, I mean, you mentioned, mentioned Henderson, the rain King, and, you know, we had, we had done a podcast on that. It's probably two years ago now. And I, I'm wow. just like thinking about that. And, you know, we all, I think kind of had like a very positive response to it. It was almost like, you know, it's a very like life affirming book in a way. And it is sort of, in my opinion, like a satire of, you know, the, self-help find yourself travel thing right but it also relies so directly on this idea that you could say that well he's making fun of it but in all jokes there's also just an element of truth that the only way for him to have this classic rich you know large american male find himself and sort of reorient his path somewhat in a humorous way was to rely directly on this africanist presence and so Part of me wonders, like, how much was Bello actually playing with that directly, or if it's just so built into kind of, again, the American, like, national literature that it wasn't even thought. He thought he was just kind of making a joke of it. But, you know, Morrison makes plenty of arguments as to why, you know, this is just simply a foundation of things. It's, it's so much deeper than that. So yeah. that kind of, like, I don't know, unsettled hard, me as well. coded into our DNA. Right whether it's our literature or our everyday interactions. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> well, the thing I was thinking while, while, while reading this is um, she does a lots of uh, semiotic analysis. She takes in account a lot of small things that the characters do or the point of view of the, of the narrator. And these small things might be overlooked by a non-experimented uh, reader, but now, it's not that this is new for me, but this just reminded me that it's important to take uh, a good look at those stuff. Because now that I'm reading uh, uh, the Song of Solomon, I th I'm beginning to notice these things. And it's, it's, an, it's a nice um, path to just draw in my brain, because I know that this is not a crazy interpretation of mine. It's, it's basically thought this way. So I think that's a nice, uh, it's a nice thing to remember. Right. And I mean, every opportunity for writing a line of dialogue is, is a chance to encode additional information. I think she goes through and she kind of picks apart a large portion of a Hemingway book that I haven't read, and I think a lot of people probably don't start with that one. Was it to have and have not? I've never read. Yeah, it. so I think no. maybe it's quote unquote. no, but but I think it's it, it's also because of what she's saying about how uh, critics critics uh, select certain books and they just uh, eliminate the rest, and how this helps to build a a mind frame for readers, and so we should just go and look for the rest because there's something in there that might be important or more universal. I mean, I also think about, I'm about a quarter through Song of Solomon. And after reading this essay, I was thinking a lot about, you know, talk about the burden that Morrison has, as an author of her stature now seems to carry in terms of what she's trying to both put out into the world and arguably undo. And, and it makes me have a lot more reverence and respect for her. I mean, I read Beloved a long time ago. I don't think it resonated as much because I was just too young and stupid to really grok what it was doing. But uh, And I'm anxious to reread it. But it not only makes me think about 
you know, it, it's not enough almost for her to be an, a great, brilliant writer. She is freighted with a lot more that she talks about in this book in terms of being the antidote to it. And and so you see in her in Song of Solomon so far, I feel like it's threading this needle between the sort of Zora Neale Houston sort of very dialectical, very sort of, you know, it's how people talked in the time and the sort of more James Baldwin idealized sort of, no, I need to present a much better, you know, face for our culture and our race. And she's trying to kind of thread that needle. So there's all of that in there, but in a way that just is kind of grabs from all those things. And and I'm anxious to kind of read a lot more of it because I'm I'm, again, like you said, framing it in a much different way. Yeah, I uh, I mean, maybe we're like getting a little bit ahead of ourselves because we have a Song of Solomon podcast to talk about this. But I like literally just read a section uh, where she's talking about one of the characters. It's basically any time a crime happens to a black person, they go out and commit the exact same crime to a white person. And it almost felt like she was addressing a that, but also with respect to sort of literature in general, because as I was reading this in parallel, it's sort of, like you said, the ideal between like an idealistic versus maybe sort of like the James Baldwin approach. And I also think about sort of Richard Wright protest literature and just her trying to balance these things. It's almost kind of a commentary of, you know, it's not it's not a tit for tat thing. Right. There is not this there is not this white literature. There is not this black literature moving forward. It needs to sort of be all encompassing. And it also sort of pull, pulls into the old thing of like, you know, the quote that sometimes you hear people say that I think is kind of universally regarded as not appropriate is it transcends race. Because if you're ever pulling race out of something, you're removing a very important component. And so if it is a component, it's very relevant. And it, so it has to be part of the whole. So I think that's kind of one of the vibes I'm getting from like a lot of her books, having having read this and like rethinking about them is just it's not, you know, it's not African-American literature. This is a term that James Baldwin always kind of hated. He just he wanted to be outside of that. Right. But it also is totally about that. And so I think you can't really separate them because then you're removing a lot of the whole point. And she's, she's not really trying to position anything in a specific category. And like that's just such an amazing thing to have to take on and kind of like the burden of that to be able to present that. And you're right, she is almost kind of the first and foremost person doing that in American literature now. And you almost, you see those quotes on like her books that like she is the American writer. And as like simple of a statement as that is, I'm kind of starting to feel that that's very true. And we're nodding our heads in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. I, I don't want to, in, in reading some of the obits about Roth, there was a quote in there that said something, to, they were trying to defend his work. And, the, and one of the um, quotes in there was that literature, great literature should present things as they are, not in this, not idealized. And and the point they were trying to make is that, you know, that's what the Soviet Union asked its authors to do and the Soviet bloc. They wanted, they don't want stories about real life. They want this idealized notion of what the world should be. And it was an interesting quote that kind of stopped me, right? It's sort of like, oh, if we go back to Henderson and go back to this idea that you were saying that like Bello was Bello just kind of, you know, showing the world as he knew it and, you know, warts and all. And this is what gets caught up in the, in the exploration of that. But I think what's, what's really interesting is I think as a, as a, as a society right now, we're really trying to push this ideal. We all need to kind of be woke and, and hold this sort of line of the idealized world of what it should be in the face of what's going on. Um, and I think that reading that quote and then thinking about this essay and then reading some of Song of Solomon again made me appreciate like what Morrison is trying to do, right? She's not present, you know, there, what she's presenting in Song of Solomon so far is warts and all. It's like, this is my experience and it needs to be talked about in, in my way as opposed to these Poe's or Hemingway's, but I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And I think that's, a, again, a very tough needle to thread if you're, if you're burdened, or whether, it's, whether she wants to be or not, with this kind of you know, responsibility. Yeah, I agree. Um, before I read this book, I read Citizen by Claudia Rankin. She's a poet and uh, 
the book is basically a mashup between an essay and prose poetry. It's and, and visual art. It's unique, but it's it's a book that is heavily. It's very strong. The, what what she's describing there, it's terrible, but it's a reality. It's what what is happening. It's not something ideal. On the contrary, she comments on things that are happening, uh, violent crimes so, or just microaggressions of every day. And I do think by reading this, it helped me to understand a little bit better because, again, I am out, an outsider. I don't, um, I don't, un- I, I didn't understand this, even if I have seen it before in television or in other media. But this just helped me to broaden to broaden th- some of my thoughts about it. Right. And I guess, you know, to kind of keep this somewhat snappy, you know, she wraps this up in like a very, I would say, er- Eric, you made this comment before we started recording, but, you know, it ends where it begins or it begins where it ends either way. Right. You know, choose your spot in the loop. But um, basically she says that, you know, all of us readers and writers are bereft when criticism remains too polite or too fearful to notice a disrupting darkness before its eyes. And so I think... You know, tying it back to kind of the original stuff is what's what's the goal of this book? How do I how do I view it? Why is it useful? And it really is trying to tear off some of that politeness and allowing you to kind of see both things you've already read in the past and things that you're reading in the future as having some of these components and then saying that, you know, this is why art exists. It, it shouldn't be ripped of its political stuff. It shouldn't be ripped of its racial components. It should exist in its entirety. And then there's a lot of information coded into that. So I don't know, do you guys, what's your remaining thoughts on, you know, why this may or may not be relevant to read, you know, almost 30 years later? Well, I I think this is really relevant because it's presenting the discussion around these topics in a way that gives you tools, further tools to to explore and talk about it. And I would argue that a lot of the discourse that's happening today, whether it's on Twitter or on the news or you know even in even in the sort of insular literary circles, it tends to be often very shrill and accus- accusatory rather than going, "Hey, did you ever think about it this way? And here are some tools in which to look at it in this way. And I think the reason this thing to me is so precious now is because it's giving not only its modulated tone, which I think helps kind of make people receptive to listening to it, but also that it's giving you, it's showing you, hey, here's how I see this and here's how you can look at this stuff differently and begin to see it as I do. And I think that in some ways that is its most important gift because I don't think when we talk about these things these days, it neither has this modulation nor is it giving the people who maybe don't know how to talk about it or don't know or are ignorant of this stuff the tools in which to be aware of it. And I think this thing goes way beyond literature for me. You know, it's it's really a lesson in discourse and mm-hmm. how to talk about these very touchy subjects that regardless of who we are, we should all be talking about. Yeah, I do agree. Um, this is a good reminder of why we should be aware of this um, problems and, and just the fact that we have to be responsible about or the way we approach things. That's one thing. We should be respectful, but also we should we should have a position we we shouldn't just repress our thoughts just because we think it's wrong we should first educate ourselves and try to th- to see how the other person sees it sees it and then well trying to talk about it but in a respectful and non uh, violent way that's where knowledge is which is always easier said than done right oh, of course but yeah. we, you have to try right Yeah, I mean, she doesn't pull any punches. I mean, the second I started reading this, there was certainly shame that I felt and and thinking about all the literature that it was important to me. And suddenly she gives you this lens. But at the same time, she's very generous and sort of, look, this has happened for centuries. Here's the way I see it. And here's the way you could take this and think about it differently and sharing with it others, too. And I again, I just think that's such a gift 
Right. You know? I mean, it's very fortuitous that I think we read this in 2018 where we are right now. I almost feel like and you mentioned like her kind of like rational, very even keeled way of presenting things. I almost think that, you know, because this was written, I think, early 90s and is representative of some of her lectures that were coming out of maybe prior years, that it is so well thought out and contained that it's almost before the Internet age turned us into these trivial, you know, back and forth. You said, you know, Twitter discourse, but that's kind of a, you know, an oxymoron. But like, it is nice that it framed everything before we just got so fragmented and so chaotic and stuff like that. And so I, I really love the tone of that. And I like that. I like that idea that, you know, it is really a tool set. Like it can be applied to many different things outside of the topics of literature and race. It's how do you analyze something that has been happening for a very long period of time and then potentially make the decision to think about that moving forward and to maintain that kind of, you know, rational outlook. And I think that's, like I said, easier said than done. That's that's just a hard, it's a hard skill as as the frail humans that we all are. And so on that note, with our ever so slightly sharpened tools, join us next time on the Books of Some Substance podcast, where we talk about Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon.